So let's start with, um, I'm really keen to understand how you came to hold the views that you do. Because in the stereotypical pigeonholed world that we live in here, it's just very unusual for somebody who might be essentially a conservative to espouse some of the things you have espoused about the way society and government ought to operate. So can we start with a little bit about you? Gosh, um, first of all, um, thank you. Very generous, charming uh, opening. I wonder if we could take the video, I could send it to others. <laughs> so I get sort of replication rather than at scale. Um, but, um, and, and thank you to the Centre for Social Impact. It's, uh, it's wonderful to speak here and, and it's wonderful to me so many people from essentially the coalition in my view of the future socio-economic settlement because make no mistake that's what's going on um, if you go onto the ABC website the drum I'm on the drum tonight there's an essay by me it's just a, a little blog post really in which I argue that both left and right have created the same outcome so they don't differ and if one's a serious historian or philosopher, if things that claim to be different produce the same thing, they're not different. And what's the thing that our settlement has produced over the last 30 to 40 years? Oligopoly and oligarchy. And uh, the destruction of social capital, the destruction of communities, and governance by both individualism and collectivism, both of which are repulsive to me and damaging to society because they produce the outcome that I've just articulated. So the basic question, and again, very, very grateful for it, is how did I come by the views I came by? And I think I, the short answer to that is I lived through the failure of both left and right. And uh, I experienced almost at the same time the failure of both left and right. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, throughout my life, I've experienced and seen the failure of the left. And the failure of the left is the idea that the state stands proxy for all good, that equality is the way to reach equity, and that um, in some sense the, the model of universalism that's been pursued um, is utterly, utterly, achieves the reverse of what is intended. So let me back into, into that and then I'll go on to how the right has failed. So, very put very simply, put as simply as I, I can I can imagine, the left came up with the state to save the poor from being poor. The left came up with the state to stop poverty. With the exception of several states, and I think they are exceptions, that do prove other rules, the state has not succeeded in those aims. The state has not stopped people from being poor. Why? Why has the state not stopped people from being poor? Because on the one hand it doesn't give enough. On the other hand, it gives in the wrong way. And in effect, the state, or the welfare state as we know it, has achieved, has engineered a situation in which it causes poverty and separates people from the sources of wealth and the production of wealth. So how does the state and how does the left cause poverty? It essentially sets up welfare as a small supplement uh, to your income, or indeed if that's all your income, you're in real trouble. Um, and it will separate you from production for the giving of that income. And by separating consumption from production, it essentially, progressively and aggressively, denies those for whom it suggests uh, cannot own and should never own, it denies them wealth. Another way to typify this, and this for me is always a very interesting one, is if the left operates as if the whole aim of, lay, of, of its project is to unite capital and labour. But everything it does separates capital and labour. I remember Manny Shingbal, who's a wonderful Jewish labour lord, um, who, uh, when he was head of the... We don't have lords in this country, do you realise? <laughs> we can argue about, actually, it might be a good thing to have that. But anyway, let's, let, let's leave that. I'm a great, I'm a monarchist. I, you know, we can go, go back to that uh, on another issue. Republicanism leads to creation of elites and uh, the destruction, because... Anyway, what that's a philosophical thing. Uh, you know. <laughs> Keep going, sorry. Um, it's, it's an interesting question. So what, what Manny Shinwell did is he said to the NUM, look, why don't you come on and help manage the National Coal Board? And the union said, crikey, we don't want to do that. 
The last thing we want to do is own the means of production. We'd rather lobby for higher wages. So we asked them again, and they said the same thing again. And so what's going on there is people would rather have representation for wages rather than ownership. And the left has essentially surrendered the project of ownership throughout the 20th century. And if you don't have a project of ownership, you cannot solve poverty, period. Now, in addition to which, um, the project of the left um, not only was to destroy the possibility of ownership, it also, paradoxically, and in my country, it became liberal. The left became liberal, particularly in the 1960s, particularly with 60s values and 60s culture. And it became not just liberal, but libertarian. And essentially it preached that family was fascism, commitment to people was, was itself sort of a bourgeois act, that, that in, in some sense any notion of reciprocity was a limit upon a self, and the true task of a radical left-wing politics was to free the self from all bounds, like Marcuse and R.D. Lang, and indulge whatever glorious fantasy awaited thereafter. Now this was joy to middle-class people, because this allowed them to do anything to anyone, anywhere. But this was death to working class people because what it did is it took apart the social fabric uh, and the structures that previously had maintained them against aggressive forms of social capital of capitalism. Indeed, one of the interesting things is the responses by working class people to capitalism have always been social and relational. That's what trade unions are. And that's what cooperatives are. And they are always the response. But what the left did is it denied that response, but it's because it said the primary unit of political radicalism is the individual. So paradoxically, collectivism produced individualism. And that form of individualism was a virus that then passed over to the right. And now we move on to the failures of the right. So what is the primary, just to repeat the structure I outlined before, what is the primary failure of the right? The primary failure of the right, using the market as its proxy, is it has not delivered mass prosperity. I would be all for the right, just as I would all be for the left. If the left could solve poverty, I'd be left wing. If the right generated mass prosperity, I'd be right wing in the current manifestations. But the right did not guarantee prosperity. What the right did is it reinscribed, rearticulated serfdom. Hayek's famous book, The Road to Serfdom, is a critique of the collectivist state arguing that we will enslave people. Hayek was right. The form of capitalism he articulated and he argued for was a form of capitalism that was plural, multiple sources of wealth, multiple sources of property, and a plural economy where all could participate and all could exchange. Thanks to its bastard inversion by Milton Friedman, what actually happened is the form of right-wing economics that we practice isn't, doesn't produce liberty, it produces a new form of serfdom. Mm -hmm. Because it creates an economy not where wealth flows downwards to all, it creates an economy where wealth is sucked upwards. Now as I've said at several points, and I said in my essay on ABC, there's several figures that exemplify this. In um, 1974, the top 1% of US families owned just under 9% of US GDP. In 2007, the top 1% of US families own 23.5% of US GDP. And what I say to the right, and I said it last night with, with, the liberal, with the Liberal Party, is they are creating a condition for Marxism. Because instead of creating a, a property-owning democracy, which I profoundly agree in, though I don't want it just in one aspect of residential housing, um, I want, uh, what they're creating is a, a proletariat in the sense of people who are reliant only on wages and can never own and will not own. But the trouble is the return to labour from wages has been falling almost, well, approaching 40 years now. The highest return to labour as a proportion of GDP was in 1968. Ever since then, returns have been falling. And again, it's progressive and aggressive. So um, I went through the actual labor indices. I was in front of another insane neoliberal economist who was saying everything's good, everything's growing, wealth is everywhere. And I had the actual tables of income from the US uh, census. And they demonstrate that for unskilled manual workers, they earn more in the 1970s than they do now. That position is growing. And it's actually starting to affect the middle class. We're undermining the basis of a middle class life now. Essentially because of changes in technology 
and chains of employment, but also the way capital works, the way structures work, and the way we have market concentration. And then my first final point about the failure of the right, I hope I've been equitable in my condemnation of both. Uh, the other failure is, is we have this rhetoric of free markets, and whenever you hear free markets, I'm sorry, you know monopoly is what the result will be. And under the rhetoric of free markets, we've seen unprecedented market concentration. Most markets now are dominated by three, three firms. I'm told in Australia, most of your markets are duopolies. Mm. And what that does is you create essentially a cartel or a rentier settlement. And you have rent seeking behavior because you don't have genuine competition. And part of the way monopolists, and remember monopolists always hate capitalism, Part of the way monopolists maintain it is they, is they use as their rule the rhetoric of free markets and the standard of consumer welfare. And consumer welfare is a pro-monopoly, pro-market mm. concentration standard, and it's that which is authored through competition law. So just to bring this little how I came to my views to, to, to a close. So what I want to say is in their current manifestations, both left and right are internally and externally corrupt. They're internally corrupt because they don't even live up to the standards they set themselves. They're externally corrupt because they refuse to face the reality that, that our citizens and, and many of us face every day. So I want a new politics, period. Now, a lot of my work is about what that new politics will be. On the one hand, I think the profoundly important thing to do is resist libertarianism, both socially and economically. Because libertarianism is what's destroyed the tradition on the left and destroyed the tradition on the right. And what that means is we need a new form of social conservatism, not a reactionary form, not something that kind of wants to domesticate women or anything like that. But what I prefer to call a form of social conservation. We need to extol and celebrate and indeed even sanctify our relationships, but build them out and ensure that we have reciprocity across the board in all that we could do. And in that sense, I'm a Burkean. And Burke said, we proceed to a knowledge of the universal through love of the particular. And only through loving your family do you proceed to love of human beings. I agree with that. And I think if you do it the French way, which is the other way, you have a legacy like Algeria, Vietnam, Rwanda, Cambodia, etc. And I'm being quite serious about that. Utopianism, where you apply the universal first, is what disassociates your society. So the fundamental point I'm trying to say on the, on vis-a-vis uh, -vis the left is the left got itself into a position where it's in favour of gay marriage, but it's profoundly suspicious of heterosexual marriage. There's something very wrong with heterosexual marriage, but gay marriage is absolutely fantastic. And what that actually means is the left has become oddly disassociative. Because it's been destroyed by libertarianism, it's become profoundly individualist. And that's why you have all this rights talk. And these aren't rights that, again, are mutual. They're all one-way claim rights, one-way entitlement rights. And if you have one-way entitlement rights, you actually reinscribe collectivism. Because collectivism is the only way you can deal with rights. And actually, what that does is destroy society in the realm of the mediated middle, which is where civilization, life, and humanity come from. Now, by the same token, all of this also applies to the right. And what we actually need isn't a form of individualist capitalism, because if you have an individualist capitalism, you'll create a society mm -hmm. in which uh, only some win and most lose. Mm -hmm. And when you, create an in when you have an individualist private sector economy, you are actually statist and welfareist, because you will create the outcome that only a statist, collectivist state can redeem. So all these people who think they're right wing, they're actually left wing. And all these people who think they're left wing are actually right wing. And what's even worse is actually there's a covert, unacknowledged, and again, because of that, in my view, deeply damaging um, alliance between the libertarian left and the libertarian right. So what I want to do is reject it all, because I think it will no longer deliver, and we need something profoundly new. So to sum up, we need a loving, form of social conservation. I'm not interested in making more minorities because we're all minorities and majorities in our own selves anyway. But uh, what I want is a form of social reciprocity that preserves and celebrates the associations we have and seeks to increase and augment them. On the right, in terms of capitalism, I want a win-win capitalism. I want a participative economy and I want a mutualization of return. And I think this is the politics of the future 
and I, because the politics of the present, which we're living through, is the collapse of both of the prior idioms. Thank is that you. Enough of a, yes. no, right, good. You didn't tell us whether you were sitting in a garret thinking this through, or working in a think tank, or a teenager, or... It's, it's, but before you do that, sorry. I want to just show you what's in the room in an Australian context. How many of us think that we want a new politics? There you go. Goodness. <laughs> I just want you Goodness, to know. That was quite moving. <laughs> I just want you to know. <laughs> well, there's a moved, yearning yeah. in this country, but yeah. we don't have the answer. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't even have the means either yet, but there's definitely a yearning in this country because I think we've experienced exactly as you <coughs> described the failure of what used to be the right and the left. The outcomes of that <coughs> in this country is the same. So sorry, I interrupted you. Were, were, were you in your garret? Were you in working with someone that? Um, it was. It was, it was. It was. It was everything, really. It's from. You know, living in Liverpool, which is a city I adore. You know, we defeated the U-boats from Liverpool. You know, it's a great, noble, romantic place, <laughs> and um, it was destroyed, and it was destroyed by the left and the right, and you saw it. So the militant left. The militant welfareist left took all agency out of Liverpool and created a society where you actually had to cheat to get ahead. Mm. And then the right just abandoned Liverpool and eviscerated it. So, and growing up through that, you, you felt that keenly. And then in my own life, I first, my first degree was in politics. And then I thought, no, pol politics can be solved outside of philosophy. So then I went on to study philosophy, and then I thought, well, nothing philosophical can be sold outside of theology, and I ended up uh, a theologian. And I remain a theologian. I, I, um, I think that, oddly, we're back in the realm of first principles again, because you can't build a new politics unless you have first principles. But I, just because I'm profoundly convinced by Thomas Aquinas and Henri de Lubac and St. John's Gospel, what that actually means is, for the first time, we can debate about first principles, and that's the debate we need. And so the politics I'm in favor of isn't a religious politics, but it's a new politics of first principles around what do we want? What is human flourishing? What sort of society do we want? And all of my motivations come from, oh God, this is gonna sound really kind of weak and pathetic, but it's true. Um, a certain sort of love for human beings, you know? I mean, I can't really put it any more truly than that. And so much politics seems to be rested on a form of status competition. Do you know what I mean? That, that a form of contempt. Yeah, and, we and do, you sort we of, do know that. I, I can't stand that. You know, and I, I think it's, I mean, my own family background is quite interesting because one side of my family is very wealthy and, and, and the other side of the family was kind of working class and I like the working class side far more. And I thought they were far better and far more profound and, and far, kind of nobler. So it's that sense of, of, um, of what we value. And, and, and it's about trying to create, as Burke said, a new form of, of, um, of communitarianism. And for me, the real debate is between communitarianism and liberalism. Mm -hmm. And the real enemy isn't liberalism itself, because I'm liberal, because I, I don't think I know the mind of God. I believe in mediated universals, and I believe in I hate absolutism, so so in that sense. But I, but liberalism, when it thinks it's the only truth, is a is the worst sort of absolute because it says there is nothing, there is no objective value, there is only will. So for me, Red Tory, which is obviously is an odd title, is an attempt to articulate the new political and cultural settlement. Mm -hmm. And it and it, it its name is very particular to the British situation. I understand you don't. You mean have, the big society? Or the well, big I. In some sense, you have to be aware of culturally what symbolically works yeah. in your, in your yeah. own nation. And yeah. I'd be interested as what sort of you all thought would work in Australia. I'm still struggling to think what would work in America. But what's clear is across, across the world, there's significant interest in this new settlement. Mm. And I've had discussions like this across the world. And that is because globalization is producing the same outcomes everywhere. So we shouldn't be, as historians, as I'm sure many of you are, we shouldn't be surprised if in some sense a new global politics is forming. Now this won't be the shallow politics of kind of consumerism or, or single issue politics or rights-based rubbish. 
This will be a genuine new universalism, and it has to be rich and deep and, and bright and long, and it has, to, it has to be social, it has to be economic, it has to be political, it has to be particular, it has to be universal. And that's what I'm interested in broken. And will it happen in my lifetime? It's already happened. But will it come to a, a dominant global presence in, the, can, in the near future? I always think Are there of the ways we can enable it better. I always think of the monks in Ireland, you know, who, who at a certain point around 400 AD said, "Look, Europe's really going to be in trouble. We're going to have to have a centuries-long project." <laughs> and they really did think like that. They, they really, human beings really thought like that, and they sacrificed their lives, you know, for to maintain an idea. And then, you know, it flooded back and took over Europe and produced Western civilization. So I think you just have to have a politics of creating a legacy for the next generation. When Newton said we stand on the shoulders of giants, what he was saying is human life is progressive. Because we die, what happens is we create gifts for the next generation. However, to be slightly more optimistic than that broad sweep of history, I am stunned at the progress that's been made. I am just a, a, you know, a small academic who was previously in a provincial university in the north of England it wasn't a particularly good university, and it was, you know, rightly ignored by everyone. Um, and now, it's not like that. No. And also, many of the proposals that I've advocated and my think tank, Res Publica, has proposed, I mean, I don't, how can one say this? Most of them are accepted, hmm. and most of them are now law in Britain. Yeah, so let's get on to that bit. Yeah, so that, so that's what's exciting. Um, I think we've got a, a clear idea of the principles uh, underpinning um, your beliefs and and, yeah. your, and and I think it's true that we are living in a time we are on the cusp well the, we, we've started something different and sometimes when you're just at the beginning of it you don't identify it readily enough because we don't have a label called big society in this country so I was wondering if you could move from the these are the principles which have moved me to this mm -hmm. understanding and I love the, the notion, a loving form of social conservation. Um, that's not a word I think I'd hear many uh, Australian politicians of the moment using. But can you tell me how we move from those uh, underpinning principles to the really hard practicalities of transforming that into a policy level? Shall I tell you how I operate? Shall I tell you my political tactics? Please do. Okay. My political tactics, wherever I go, whatever country I'm in, is always to identify what are the problems? What are the long-term trends? Where is this society going? And so that's what we hope to do in our yeah. workshop. So, so what you do is you try to get a sense of the 10-year future of a nation, the 20-year future of a nation. And then you step back and you look, is, is that what we want? And almost invariably it isn't. And then what you have is then you have the basis for new policy. Because you never, begin, you never begin in politics with where you are. You always begin with where people are. You never begin with the universal. You always begin with the particular. And then what you do is you re back to wherever you are what their problems are. And you let them shape them. They'll go, and if you're right, because what you're doing is forming a concept for an intuition they don't have, sorry, for an intuition that they haven't conceptualised. They go, God, yeah, I've always thought that. God, yeah, I've always thought that. And in politics, if you come up with a concept where people have that response, you know you're doing good politics. And then on the basis of that, you start to, you start to say, you start to then grow the policies. And you start to be very specific in each sector and grow the, those policies. And then you present them and you put them out there and let there be political competition about them. So, because if they're right, if they address most people, politicians are interested in it, because this is the primary ammunition of politics. And then if it's out there, and then, then you can also, you need to crowdsource it. You need other people, you can't narrate it yourself. You need other people to say, oh, you're wrong here, you're wrong there, this is what's right, this is what's wrong. And also, if you're doing something really good, you'll bring together an uneasy coalition. There'll be right-wing people in the room and very left-wing people in the room. But you shouldn't worry about that. That's a sign of success. That's a sign of creating a broad coalition that actually has the leverage to do something. 
If you're in a world where everybody's the same, you're not doing politics. You're doing something else, you're doing lobbying. So, and when you create, when you create that, then you're in a situation where, where you can do some really real good. So at the moment in Britain, I think we've done some marvelous legislation. And I think the Conservative government, you know, although it's made a lot of mistakes in some areas, has done the most pro-social legislation that one can almost think of. You know, it's unbelievable. And also what's good is the Labour Party hasn't, has sort of said, we're not going to oppose it. Yeah. So let me just go through some specific bills yes, and, then, and then that will help you. For me, one of the most important bits of a legislation in Britain is the Localism Act. And what the Localism Act primarily does is push budgets, capital and rights down to the front line. And we argued, and other people have argued, that uh, uh, some of those rights should be quite interesting. I argued, first of all, that communities should have the right to take over the public expenditure spent on them. Now, that's quite radical. That envisages a turning inside out of the state and civilising the state. And moreover, because public, the state, often isn't very good at addressing specific problems, what it allows is, is non-standardisation as a response. So one of the great drivers of cost is the fact that the state says we have to deliver the same thing everywhere. But if you deliver the same thing everywhere, what you get is a postcode lottery everywhere because people's needs are different. And so what we need is a public service that can respond to differentiation. Now what's a really exciting in the localism bill is a, is a it are measures that allow you not just to capture one budget stream, but all of them on a place-based model. Yeah. So you can take over every, you know, mental health, social services, a certain extent crime, you know, and pick it and bin collection. And you could then can help that create a political economy to form a community and then you have a political economy, a new form of associative community, and you completely change the way the state commonly operates. So the localism bill contains so much, I can't go on, but elected police commissioners, uh, local neighbourhood planning, so you have the ability to write your own uh, local plan and for that to have some genuine sovereignty in the settlement. There's lots of other important things that have been done. Big society capital has been set up, and this is a wholesale banking uh, uh, institution that attempts to provide a wholesale market that can actually get the wholesale capital behind social enterprises and create the financing and the normal income streams for them, which I'm sure you'd all like. There's cultural things like the National Citizen Service that tries to get the majority of 16 to 17 year olds to volunteer for civic service. There's philanthropic um, revolutions taking place in order to make things easy to give. So for instance, we at ResPublica argue that gift aid, which is a tax concession, should have been done on mobile phones and for small donations. That was accepted, that, was, that went in. Then there's other things like the Cooperative Consolidation Bill, which actually for the first time draws together all of the cooperative legislation into one modern form, and so creating the conditions for it to be normal and mainstreamed which uh, you know, I think is quite an achievement. And another one of my ideas was, was public sector mutualisation, spinning companies out of the public sector, not for privatisation, mm. and not keeping them there for nationalisation, but for mutualisation. And that, then um, I think one of the most interesting bills that's come out of this is Chris White's, it's now, it's passed. The social value bill. Social value bill, that's the real game changer in my view. Isn't it? Because well, what that allows, is says for the first time, most public service commissioning goes to, again, the duopoly or the triopoly of three big companies get everything. We use the word procurement here, yeah, more formally yeah, than yeah. commissioning. So procurement is already a rigged game, but it's rigged game because they have best value legislation, which is an attempt to introduce market, marketised forms. But it just goes to the big players who, again, erect barriers to entry and shut out charities and social enterprises. What uh, Chris's bill says is every single act of public expenditure has to go through social and environmental and economic audit. And what this really means is it's suggesting that best value legislation is no longer the criteria by which you commission. And it's giving commissioners the ability to commission differently and commission small and medium sized mm. enterprises. And the hope is that what it does is it localises commissioning rather than have standardised commissioning. 
So I think that will be a, boost. a major a uh, transformative uh, element. And there's no doubt um, some other factors and, and measures um, that I haven't talked about. I think what is important is the public service reform and the public services white paper. The fundamental principle of which is that the state should be indifferent to process and only con concentrate on outcome. And if you're indifferent to process and concentrate on outcome, what that means is public services itself becomes a form of um, innovation. So normally under the old state settlement, everything had to be done in the same way, everywhere. Now under this new dispensation, we're free. It doesn't, I don't care how you educate your kids as long as you produce this outcome. I don't care how you, do, you know, fix the bridges, build a road, do whatever, as long as you have that outcome. Now potentially this was a massive improvement, as was payment by results, which is the type of economic permission that allows this model to take place. However, in practice, there's been lots of problems because entry to the black box, as it were, was dictated by the capital, you know, the capital reserves you had that shut out small business, that meant charities couldn't go in because if they came out the other side on payment by results and failed, the whole organisation would essentially be bankrupt. But well, we have the equivalent yeah. of social benefit bonds mm -hmm. here, which is the Australian variation of a social impact bond, the payment by results. Mm. It's just in pilot stage, but it's in this state, and it's the second in the world. Very, very interesting, very interesting. And as you know about, you all know what social impact bonds are, I assume. I think most people yeah. would. Um, do you all, do you need an explanation? So um, my sense is they do, otherwise, otherwise it'd be more yeah. emphatic. Yeah. So, so um, in, in, we've done one of the first social, I always hesitate because I never know quite what's going on in Guatemala or anything else. Mm -hmm. But No, you, you are the first. Okay, one of the, one of the very interesting developments is essentially aligning capitalism with the good. One of the errors, I think, is the idea that capitalism is evil and only the state is good. What I think is really going on here is the idea that if we can get markets working around ethical principles, we actually produce social outcomes. So prisoner reoffending is profoundly interesting. In Britain, and it's slightly higher for men, slightly lower for women, uh, after three years, everybody who's been released from prison, of that prison release cohort, some 66% are reconvicted. And which it's is massive. similar here. Massive. Very similar level here. Massive and terrifying in terms of what they do and the cost to society. Now if you let, if you then let social enterprises, often faith-based but not necessarily, actually deal with prisoner rehabilitation, those reoffending rates fall incredibly. They fall beyond all ken, really. And some uh, social enterprises achieve uh, re-conviction re rates of 15%. So they save the state a lot, a lot of money. But how do you fund the enterprise between the three years from release to cohorts, you know, to the standard? Well, what you do is you say to the state, and the state says, we will pay you below a certain period, below a certain point for every person who doesn't get reconvicted. Then you have a contract with a blue chip company, the state, and then you can go to the private sector, and the private sector will fund you during those three years. That's a social impact bond. Now they're limited, I don't think they have the range people hope for them, but what it is, they're new, they're they're new. new but I think that what you need, the difficulty with human beings and society is, is you need a very standardized matrix around which you can create the model. If it, if it isn't standardized, it's quite difficult to get it, but they have, a, they have an applicability, you know, you, they, they really do, because their targets, normally targets pervert your outcome but this is a target that actually is your vocational outcome. Mm. So, so they're kind of, they're the type of measures that, that are going to scale. And there's so many ideas around it, but the basic idea is if we can group people together, the benefits from association actually outweigh almost any other mode of human delivery. And just so one doesn't think this is just for middle-class people, the example I always use is pensions. If you get self-management of pensions, you can get, at the end of your working life, a retirement pot 30 to 40% bigger than it would otherwise be, because you've taken out the compounding effect of management charges. 
And all you need for that is good people to come together with good advice in a group and manage that self-advice by themselves. And it produces a massive, massive, massive return. God knows what the taxation cost would be of delivering the equivalent. So what I want to suggest by that is this isn't just for the poor. This is for all of us because it creates the conditions which are needed for prosperity in the 21st century. And I should shut up now, otherwise I go on too much, but I think this is true across almost everything I've done from defense, from security, from community cohesion, to small businesses, to education, to any field of human policy. But I better not go on, otherwise. I'd, I'd well, I am going to invite that. It's perfect timing. Yeah. Oh,